a beautiful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. So Eric told us that that's a new song that uh, we sang this morning. Um, I think it's going to become a fast favorite of mine. There's something about the name of Jesus. My name is Julie Klausner. I'm one of the pastors here, as Rich said earlier. And I am um, humbled and honored And I get the great privilege of not only getting to worship here and getting to be with you here this morning, um, but during that song, I recognized that I get to come and proclaim the name of Jesus with you this morning. And that is a joy. And that is um, something that I cannot fully put into words, but something that I'm deeply grateful for. The ability to be able to come into this place and proclaim God's name, the name of Jesus, that is beautiful and wonderful and powerful. And it's a name we're going to talk about today. Do you remember the first time that you saw an image of Jesus? If you think back about your childhood or a time when Jesus came into your life, what was your first image of Jesus? When I was really little, I remember going on a scavenger hunt around the church. We were told by our Sunday school teacher, we started in the sanctuary, and she told us, I want you to go find an image of Jesus. And so she let us loose all over the church. Now, it was a smaller church, and so we got to go into the nursery rooms and into the Sunday school rooms, and we got to go up on the stage in the sanctuary, and we began to look all around for images of Jesus. And she said, I want you to bring them back here, and we're going to talk about them. So I began looking all over the church. Now, some of you may know I'm a preacher's kid. So I not only knew the church, I knew the church. And so I knew where the really good pictures of Jesus were hidden. And so I went into my dad's office and found an image of Jesus. I I remember this book from when I was little. And I knew that there was this one picture in there of Jesus. And I was like, oh, yeah, this is it. This is going to be the winner. This is the one that, that's going to come back, and the Sunday school teacher is going to say, Yes, Julie, here is the golden prize. Here is the wonderful gift for you. You got it right. So this was the image, or a similar image, to the one that I found that day. An image of Jesus in the clouds. Now, as a child, I grew up around the time of Aladdin, when people went on carpet rides in clouds, and that was a very magical thing. And so Jesus, to me as a child, was somewhat magical. I really didn't care much about the teachings. I really didn't think a whole lot about the healings, and I really didn't read a whole lot about what Jesus had to say, but I remember this image of Jesus in the clouds, and I remember thinking, wow, that is magical, almost like a fairy tale. Well, our scripture today that we're looking at talks about images of Jesus. It's this scripture that we find in Luke, and it starts in Luke chapter 9, and there's this question that Jesus poses around his own image. He asks the disciples, find your image of me, and what do you see? So the first part of that scripture says, once Jesus was praying alone with only the disciples near him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, but others, Elijah, and still others, that one ancient prophet has arisen. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? So he asks them two separate questions here. Who do the crowds say that I am? And so they begin to talk about people that are kind of similar to Jesus. They talk about John the Baptist, and they talk about another prophet named Elijah, But Jesus is kind of hitting at maybe you're not exactly on target. And I begin to wonder, if we were asking that question today, what would the crowds or what would culture say about Jesus, what would our answer be? Well, we might say that Jesus is a superhero. Jesus is my superhero. We might say that Jesus is like a hero. We might say that Jesus is like a champion like a boxer. (laughs) Take it in. Or 
We might say that Jesus is our very best friend and our buddy and our pal. <laughs> the guy that's got your back, Jack. Superhero, boxer, buddy. That's from the movie Dogma. It's one of my favorite movies. And yet, then Jesus asks this question, and he looks at the disciples, looks at Peter specifically, and says, but who do you say that I am? And I feel like that question is a little bit convicting of me today. As I think about my images of Jesus, of Jesus in the clouds, or Jesus as a boxer, or as a superhero, or as my buddy, or my friend, I kind of wonder if Jesus is saying to me, you might be missing the point just a little bit. Who do you say that I am? So Peter answers and says, right in verse, uh, where are we? Yeah, verse 20. Peter answered and said, the Messiah of God. And then he, Jesus, sternly ordered and commanded them not to tell anyone, saying, the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. So they talk about prophets, and they talk about John the Baptist, and what Jesus says in this little piece right here, after Peter answers, you're the son of God. Well, yes, but maybe not in the way that you realize. There was a misconception at the time that Jesus had already been risen from the dead. That the Jesus that was in the streets performing miracles with people was a Jesus that had already gone, undergone resurrection. That he was magical in some ways. And so what Jesus is saying to the disciples when he asks this question is maybe your, maybe your perception is a little bit wrong. Because the suffering is still to come. And so he tells them the Son of Man must undergo great suffering. Not something that's already happened. Not something that Jesus gets to bypass. The Son of Man has to undergo great suffering. It's a little bit different than Buddy Jesus. It's a little bit different than the Jesus that we find in the clouds. It's a little bit different than my magical understanding of Jesus. So he tells them this. And then he goes on to say this next part. Then he said to them all, if any, any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who want to lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if, if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? So he tells them that he's going to have to undergo suffering and then says to them, take up your cross daily. It's as if there is something about discipleship. These were his disciples. It's as if there is something about discipleship that Jesus is trying to say when he asks them, who do you say that I am? Because that question is not just about who Jesus is, but who we are as Jesus's followers. And so if we believe that Jesus is magical or our friend or our buddy or our superhero that's just going to make everything better, we might be missing the point. And so Jesus points to the cross and talks about suffering and says the Son of Man will have to undergo great suffering and then says to the disciples, take up your cross and follow me daily. Of all the signs of love, Jesus chose the cross. Christology is the way in which we understand Jesus. It's a big word, but it basically means our way of understanding Christ. And there's a connection here between Christology and discipleship. That if Jesus is the suffering servant, if Jesus is a little different than the images that we have in our mind, then maybe the way in which we live out Jesus in the world as Christ followers, as Christians has to look a little bit different as well. There's a book I've been reading um, recently called Out of Sorts by Sarah Bessie. Um, shameless plug, uh, young adults in the room, if you want to come hang out with me on Wednesday nights at 6.30, we will be talking about it. Um, but she has a chapter on Jesus, and she talks about 
the second time that she met Jesus. She talks about how the first time she met Jesus as a kid, it was magical and it was interesting and it was different. But it really wasn't the Jesus that she fell in love with. And she says, if I believed Jesus was who he said he was, then he was worth following. No longer could I look at his teachings in scripture. The words actually recorded as having come from him as mere suggestions. As he said in Luke 6, why are you so polite with me, always saying, yes, sir, and that's right, but never doing the thing I tell you? These words I speak to you are not simple additions to your life, homeowner improvements to your standard of living. They are foundation words, words to build a life. I had thought that Jesus wasn't practical and somehow unacquainted with real life, as I called it. Who could love their enemies? Who could bless those who curse them? Who could lay down his life so willingly? Who could think it was more blessed to give than receive? Who could turn the other cheek? Who? I realized that I had been rationalizing my disobedience and my lack of discipleship because I thought Jesus didn't get how it was for us real people. I was wrong. I wasn't bringing Jesus into my life. He was welcoming me into his. As Brennan Manning puts it, Jesus Christ has made himself the vital center of the Christian life. Jesus is not the heart of Christianity. He is the center of humanity and reveals to us what it means to be human. Jesus is not a part of Christianity. Jesus is the center of Christianity. What that means for us is that when Jesus says, take up your cross, that has to mean something for our life. And it can't just mean something for our life on Sunday mornings, and it can't just mean something for our life when it feels comfortable. And I find this passage a little bit convicting because in Luke's gospel, he adds a word to it that I find really irritating. Daily. Take up your cross daily. In Matthew's gospel, he just says, take up your cross. And what that's interpreted as to the disciples is this one act. This was during a time when Jesus would suffer and die for his beliefs. And this was also a time when the disciples would later suffer and die for their beliefs. And so that phrase, take up your cross, was a literal interpretation to believe and be willing to die for what you believe in. But Luke's gospel comes a little bit later. And Luke adds this word daily, saying that this is not just a one-time thing and this is not an act of death. This is a way of living. Take up your cross daily and follow me. How do we take up our cross and follow Jesus daily? So those images of Jesus, whenever um, I was a kid, we all went and scattered all around the church, and I noticed one of my friends didn't leave the sanctuary. He just kind of sat on the steps and waited for us to come back in. I thought maybe he didn't want to play our game, or maybe he thought he was too good for this or too cool for this. But as we went around and talked about the different images that we found and did our show and tell, he did something a little different. He didn't find an image he pointed at the cross. And it was as if that 10-year-old knew something that I didn't know. Take up your cross daily and follow me. Of all of the things that Jesus could have chosen, it was the cross. Sometimes we don't like to talk about the cross because it's gruesome. It makes us uncomfortable. But at the very core of what we understand about the cross is this self-giving nature of Jesus. This sacrificial understanding, this ability that Jesus has to take the understanding of the time and turn it on its head. Who do you say that I am? The disciples answered things that were stereotypical of the time because their understanding of a king, their understanding of power, their understanding of what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, should look like. All-powerful, right? And instead, Jesus says to them, 
the Son of Man, the Son of God must suffer. Turning our understanding of power, turning our understanding of authority, turning our understanding of what common sense looks like. Because I don't know about y'all, but it is almost common sense for me every day to go about my life and to do things the way that I want to do them. To get into my rhythm, to go about my to-do list, to focus on me. Our culture tells us that, right? Our culture gives us signs each and every day of things that we can do to make ourselves better, to make ourselves more, to make ourselves prettier or different to get better at something, to do better. There's so many different signs in our culture, and today what we find is this sign of the cross. The image of Jesus at the cross. And Jesus saying to his disciples, take up your cross and follow me daily. What does it mean for us to take up our cross daily? There's three words I want to give you this morning about what that might look like in your life and what it might look like in mine. The first word is surrender. It's not a word I like, but it's a word Jesus talks about. Surrender. Often we look at surrendering and we see it as weakness. But what Jesus talks about is not weakness. What Jesus talks about is humility. What Jesus talks about is laying down our life for the sake of gaining it. What does that look like for you? It seems as though surrendering has something to do with the fact that Jesus' to-do list might look a little bit different than our to-do list. Surrender. What does it look like for you to surrender? That second word is follow. And I have a question for us. Are we followers of Jesus or are we fans of Jesus? Because I think there's a difference. I often think that in the church we do a few things right. We come and we worship and we give thanks to God. And many times our intentions are so, so good. But oftentimes I wonder that we mistake being a fan of Christ for being a follower of Christ. We have people in our culture, when you ask them, so many of them say, I believe in the teachings of Jesus. And some of them have gone as far to say, I practice the teachings of Jesus, but I am not a person of religion. I'm not a Christian. And how heartbreaking it is that we find ourselves in a culture where Jesus is not at the center of our Christianity. What does it mean to be a follower? To let God interrupt your life in some way. For something to be different. As Sarah Bessie said in that book, if the teachings of Jesus are ones that I believe are true and real in my life, then my life cannot be the same. If the words we read in scripture are true, then the Jesus I find in scripture is a Jesus worth following. Are you a fan or are you a follower? The final word I want to give you today is do. Because friends, disciples are doers. They're doers. That word disciple comes from a Greek word, mathetes, which means learner. And at the very end of scripture, the last thing that Jesus says to the disciples and to the crowd after his resurrection is go and make disciples of Jesus Christ, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go and teach them everything that I have commanded you, and I will be with you. Dallas Willard says it a little bit differently, but I like his interpretation. He says, go to every ethnic group. That word ethnic comes from the word ethnos, which means all groups of people. Go to all groups of people and help them become students. Don't preach to them. Don't hand them something. Don't run to your Facebook page. Go and help others become students. And train them to do everything I have told you to. Not the things that make you comfortable, or the things their culture is already teaching you, or the things that don't come with a cost, or the things you do once a week. 
Go and train them to do everything I have told you to do. Jesus teaches us a lot. There is a lot of training that we have to do. And if you're looking for a starting point today, or if you're looking and saying, so maybe where, how do I go about this? What's something tangible I can do? I would encourage you today to start by reading the Gospel of Luke. We've been reading different pieces of it every week, but go back and read the stories and the scriptures that you find in the Gospel of Luke. Read about the woman who selflessly gave up her pride, gave up all of the things that were offered to her to give birth to Jesus. Read about a man named Joseph, the father of Jesus, who worked tirelessly and hard and kept his commitments and his promises. Read about Jesus in the temple and Jesus looking at his parents and saying, where else would I be? Read the stories of the healings. Read the stories of food. Read the Gospel of Luke and remember at the end of it, go and make disciples. Go and be doers of the word. Who do you say that I am? And is who Jesus says he is someone worth following? Not just being a fan, but laying down your life so that you might gain something. What does it mean for you to take up your cross daily? Daily. Here in just a moment, we're going to read the prayer of St. Francis again. I'm going to invite the band to come back on stage. And we're going to read this prayer again. And as we read it, as we have done over the last several of weeks, I want you to listen to that word that is repeated over and over again in that prayer. Let me sow. Let me sow. Where there is, let me sow. That's a very active word, friends. And it's maybe a good place for us when we look at what does it mean for us to take up our cross daily. There are places daily in our lives where God is calling for us to sow seeds, to bear fruit, to be Christ's unconditional love for this world. The cross is not always magical. It's not a fairy tale. But I don't think that there is any other greater sign of love, self-giving, of a way in which we ought to live, of a Christ in which we are called to follow. I want to say a prayer over us, and then I want us to say the prayer of St. Francis together. I don't expect you to have memorized it, and so it will be on the screen, and I'll prompt us uh, when we begin to read it. But let's pray together. Gracious God, we are in awe today because of all of the signs of love that you could have chosen, you chose a cross. So today we come to the cross and we proclaim that that is where our hope is found. God, today we choose to surrender. May we choose to follow. May we choose to be disciples that are both learners and doers of your great love. Will you join me as we read this prayer together? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive It is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen.